It is now seven o'clock. All the only income free. Okay, welcome everybody. So we're gonna be starting now the committee of the whole meeting uh, today on Wednesday, the 17th of February. This meeting was originally scheduled for Monday the 15th, but due to inclement weather, we uh, had to reschedule as the city building was closed down uh, in preparation for a big snowstorm and other reasons. So uh, I'd like to open this meeting um, by asking that the clerk please call the roll. Ms. Wu. Here. Mr. Sachs. Here. Ms. Hersey. Here. Mr. Brown. Here. Mr. Roberts. Here. Mr. Colebrook. Here. Mr. Miller. Mayor Marlin. Here. We received notice that um, uh, Jared Miller, Alderman Miller, would not be able to be present tonight. So um, we'll proceed without him, but he's left a few comments. We'll read those into the minutes of the meeting when we receive the items. Uh, first, I'd like to read the, um, the procedure for the meeting. Due to the government Pritzker's and mayoral emergency COVID-19 orders, the Urbana City Council chambers will, be, will not be open to the public during this meeting. Council members will meet remotely using Zoom webinar. You may watch the meeting on streaming services or on the Urbana Public Television or attend via Zoom. And the Zoom URL address is on the minutes posted at the city building uh, and also on our website. The first item then uh, is the approval of the minutes of our previous meeting dated January 19th, 2021. Are there any corrections to the minutes and do we have a motion for approval? I move to approve them, the minutes. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay, Will Holbrook makes a second. Were there corrections to the minutes? Okay, I don't see anybody with a raised hand, so um, there. So, all right, uh, maybe the, would the clerk please uh, call the roll for approval of the minutes? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Colebrook? Yes. Okay, they're approved. Are there additions to the agenda tonight? I hadn't received any notice that there would be. All right. Now we're gonna to go to uh, uh, public input and presentations. We're going to open with a presentation. Uh, the topic is water shutoffs and impending shutoff concerns. This is gonna be presented by Mr. Alan Axelrod and Scott Allen, are you prepared for that? Yes, they are. Yes. All right, go ahead then, you may proceed. Are we unmuted? Uh, I am, Scott, are you all right? Yes, can you hear me? All right, gentlemen, take it away. Yes. So um, there's going to be some rapid sections to this presentation because there's quite a lot to cover. Uh, Scott, through his capacity of the Citizens Utility Board, will go over what Illinois American Water is obligated to do and what relief is available. I'm going to be doing an, overlo uh, an overview of caseloads and shutoffs, as well as the potential resumption of shutoffs. Yes, and uh, I'm Scott Allen, Citizens Utility Board and a resident of Ward 3. And thank you, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, so this is, this is the standard for what covers consumers uh, by the um, Joint Committee on Administrative Rules called Part 280. So 
these always exist for consumers um, under any circumstances. And Alan, if you go to the next slide. Um, and at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the governor issued an emergency order to uh, put a moratorium on shutoffs for the investor-owned utilities. That expired. Some utilities in, entered into stipulations to cease shutoffs. Uh, Illinois American um, agreed to cease shutoffs only for people who express financial hardship. And so there are a couple of ways that consumers can get relief if they are experiencing hardship. Um, one of them is a ratepayer funded uh, $668,000 that they agreed to fund for consumers in need. And they've always had a, their H2O program. Um, these programs have sort of been combined. They're both run through the Salvation Army. And if somebody is in need, they can go to the Salvation Army. Just express that need. Salvation Army will make a determination as to whether or not um, they're gonna give that money. And the only requirements uh, are to provide a copy of the delinquent bill, a photo ID with a matching address, and they have to express, verbally express uh, need. I checked and there are no income verifications done either by Illinois American or Salvation Army. Um, Decisions Utility Board, we always recommend though, when people are having problems, any of their utilities, including water, that call the utility first, let them know that they're experiencing hardship. And if it's COVID related, um, that's especially important because a lot of these uh, stricter protections have come because of the, the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, one other piece of relief is coming now through the, through um, CCRPC uh, with some federal money that was made available. Champaign County is one of really a few counties in the state who has gotten this money has been set up to give it out the emergency rent assistance. I put this information here um, just you know to let people know what's available. Um, would point out though that these are through uh, appointment only through email and there is quite a long list of documents that CCRPC requires. So I'd encourage people to visit that website or call them to find out which documents they need. Um, and of course, the Citizens Utility Board is always there for a resource for consumers. Um, that's our job. We can point people uh, where to where they need to go to get help, file complaints for them if they need that. Uh, my contact information is up there. So if anybody wants to contact me with any questions, I'm always happy to help. And that concludes my portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Scott. And you did that under time. That gives me a little bit more time to uh, expand some unpleasant aspects of this. Thank you. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we had all the way back in September, the winter moratorium protections. That is a fact. Here are the winter moratorium protections that explicitly allow for utility shutoffs that specifically have provisions that should be familiar to people here when they're looking at what the moratorium used to be and continues to be. Here is what happened over the time that we had our early adoption of the winter moratorium. This is the Illinois Department of Public Health COVID caseload. On September 24th, utility shutoffs began two days after the early winter moratorium protections were adopted. Two weeks later, we saw a significant increase in caseload. And from the governor's own press releases, I'm apologizing for the blurriness here, this was published on October 29th, talking about the increase in COVID caseload, in the number of people in hospitals, the number of people in the ICUs, the number of people on ventilators and the number of people dying. And they've all exceeded their previous levels by over 60% from October 1st to October 29th. This was a complete failure of our winter moratorium protections. We were so terribly hit by this 
that after the election, when we had Halloween and the election in the same week, basically, we were such a powder keg that our rate of growth of COVID exceeded every other state in this country for over a week. When we finally put a stop to this, it explicitly said greater winter moratorium protections, providing greater protection to all residents than the statutory winter rules scheduled to take effect on December 1st, 2020. This is something that is not debatable. In 2007, during the Bush administration, there was a Congressional Research Service publication, Pandemic Influenza Analysis of State Preparedness and Response Plans. In Table 8, it specifically enumerated the continuity of essential services, including public utilities. They were looking at how many states have these protections. They didn't list the states, only seven. Turns out it wasn't us. The total number of disconnections. Oh, and by the way, water shutoffs have not stopped. They never stopped. They're still going, as was confirmed by the city manager. Thank you for doing that. To date, over 11,000 households have been disconnected by Illinois American Water alone. To date, over 20,000 households were disconnected by Ameren, Illinois alone. And Commonwealth Edison disconnected another 50,000 and change. Over 80,000 households disconnected and the vast majority of them in the period of nine weeks. We are due to repeat that spike even with the vaccine distribution if we resume utility shutoffs and if we weaken the protections that we have. That downward trend that I pointed out in that earlier graph, let's take another look at that because the presentation is pretty much done. We have had a decrease in the caseload after power shutoffs, which again affected over 70,000 households, were stopped. Not completely, Ameren has made a point to show that they are not willing to operate in good faith. They disconnected one household in December and one household in January to prove a point. We are going to have this happen again, unless if this is rigorously addressed. Thank you. Okay, so are there questions for the presentation from anybody? Okay, yes, Bill Brown. Yeah, um, in trying to address this, whether it's a pandemic here or not, I think um, especially in the when we were trying to find the people that um, were disconnected from power, is there any way when, when we get the notice, I know for power it goes through public health, is there any way to figure out which of those might be people that have moved and left um, either because they found someplace else to live? You know, we're a real mobile community um, I think every year about 15% of students at uh, Urbana School District chain, uh, move out of the district or come into the, the district. And then there's all the U of I students. So it's, if there's a way to separate out those people that, you know, have already moved for other reasons, instead of trying to contact them, that would help. Is there any way to differentiate who's actually moved and who might be um, trying to <laughs> trying to wait it out or, or cramming into a house with somebody else that would be you know a bad idea. So this reminds me of the a past uh, back and forth that we had about college student uh, poverty, where it only affected the county statistics by about two percent uh, when we had removed the student population. And so when you're talking about uh, the utility shutoffs and trying to characterize that, the best that we can do is we have the disconnect notices that were sent to the public health district when they were receiving them in the county. And that is good for backward analysis to figuring out what's going to happen. But here's the part that sucks. The requirement for receiving 
those disconnections lapses at the same time as this moratorium does. In April, we do not have any statutory mandate to receive those disconnect notices. And what we've seen from Illinois American Water is that because they were not required by that statute for those same months, they haven't been sending the public health district anything. Julie Pride messaged me saying that she did ask and she also did send an email to you all, I assume, that she asked Illinois American Water for disconnect notices and didn't get them. So we are going to be flying completely blind if we allow utility shutoffs to resume. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, yes, Cherise, go ahead. Hi, Alan <clears throat> Hi. and Scott. Thank you for, for this information. I guess what I kind of want to know as well is, um, have do you have any chance of presenting this to the governor to, you know, at all? Because, you know, our, our power regarding trying to stop this, as you already know, is like extremely limited. So how, how can we move this, you know, this information forward to make it, make people know, make the powers that be know, the other powers that be know that, you know, this is important in that it's a, it, in particularly um, during this pandemic, you know, those two correlations of shutoffs and how the, the rate goes up. So have, have you, do you have any idea if you, if you can do that or how that can be done or have you tried or? Uh, Scott, is it all right if I answer this one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, thanks for your question, Sharice. I know that that's, um, it's, it's very frustrating. What can we do about this? Yeah. So there's a, a couple different things. There's been zero published legal opinion, only someone saying that their interpretation of the state statute doesn't allow for any protections. There's been mm -hmm. zero published legal opinion about the Illinois Emergency Management Act and the Emergency Services and Disaster Act powers, which Jared Miller had sent to the city council. Mm -hmm. And that's when legal counsel had made one uh, of the claims that is not true that Illinois, uh, that Ameren, Illinois is a private utility by state statute, they are a public utility and they are regulated by the Illinois Commerce Commission. So the, the ESDA, the Emergency Services and Disaster Agency has the ability to, without limitation, temporarily restore public utility service. That sounds contradictory, but that's the way that it's worded. That's one thing that can be done. The second thing that can be done is potentially another uh, resolution from the city on this matter, because what that does is it actually generates pressure. Uh, now, regarding the um, and that pressure exists in terms of earned media coverage and the governor is going to take note. Now regarding pub presenting to the governor, I would welcome the ability to do so. The most accessible unit of government that has responsibility for this is the Illinois Commerce Commission. Uh, what we're doing as part of No Ameren Shutoffs is we are talking to cities across as many counties as we can reach one city per county to approach on this issue before we go to the Illinois Commerce Commission and start to pressure them. So I'm hoping in the next week or so, we will be able to approach additional city councils and talk to them about this as well. If they pass resolutions like you all, just like the city of Bloomington passed an initiative after you all had passed a resolution, very similar things, uh, that actually was three or four days, if I remember correctly, before Ameren uh, announced that they would stop utility shutoffs on November 18th. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation in the press release, of course, but um, as far as presenting to the governor himself, uh, my understanding is that he's uh, not a fan. So I, I don't know that we'll get that presentation. However, if people are asking for him to be an audience to a presentation uh, loud enough and uh, often, like from enough bodies, um, he may just show up. But 
as someone who is being advised by uh, scientists for how to handle the pandemic, my honest opinion is that he knows all this. Okay. I, I would, oh, um, okay. I, I would just add from, from my perspective too that, because um, uh, Cub, we participate in those uh, discussions at the Commerce Commission. The Commerce Commission has expressed that um, they don't feel that they have jurisdiction, uh, especially to extend a moratorium, and they would they would need pressure from the governor in order to do that. Well, we might have some work cut out for us. Yes, um, Mayor Marlin. Just a little bit more information. Um, you mentioned the Regional Planning Commission. I was on a meeting this week with them. They have received $6.2 million on behalf of Champaign County from the U.S. Treasury. It, it is, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing amount of money. It is available for helping with rent assistance and utilities. So people can call 877-548-4200. That's 877-548-4205 for rent assistance as well as utility assistance. This will help prevent evictions. This will help get people get caught back up on their back rent as well as back utility bills. The one difference with this program compared to past programs is that property owners can also apply on behalf of their tenants. What I'm hearing over and over again is many tenants um, qualify for assistance, but they haven't for various reasons, you know, gone through the steps to apply but landlords can help them and apply for them. And that will also prevent um, this backlog of overdue rent and utility payments. So again, anybody who has COVID related loss of income or financial difficulty should be calling that number to get an appointment. It does require an appointment. You know, they'll walk people through it, but that's the first step is to make that phone call. And it's $6.2 million for Champaign County. And Mayor, is that amount, um, which when you make the application, do you have to be able to meet uh, certain um, standards as in the LIHEAP applications? I, I don't know all the details and whether it's exactly like the LIHEAP, but you know, you, you have to prove that you're, you know, you have to prove that you, you do have COVID related revenue losses and, you know, evidence of what rent that you owe. But um, they will walk you all through that. There are people there to help. And the Regional yeah. Planning Commission is, you know, they just have a great staff and they're ready to help people. And they have $6.2 million. What's that this number again? Um, 877-548-4205. And as of a couple of days ago, they had heard or had about 300 people, but $6.2 million is a lot of money available to help people get caught up on some bills. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your- Let me add one thing uh, real quick. Go ahead, Tom. Um, so the program that the mayor outlined is excellent. There is an automatic option that uh, I forgot to mention when Sharice had asked me a question earlier. Uh, there is uh, SB 3066. It was a bill that was introduced in the lame duck session of the Illinois General Assembly. It provided for direct automatic payments to utility providers and to housing providers to manage the arrears of their customers or tenants. And uh, according to uh, notes received um, at the last Democratic party meeting, uh, Carol Ammons had uh, said that she would be supporting the reintroduction of that bill. But one of the things that we could do as a community is talk to State Senator Scott Bennett uh, to make sure uh, that he's on board. Um, the, the reason that we didn't get that uh, passed in the Illinois General Assembly uh, during the lame duck session is because there was only one sponsor of the bill, uh, Laura M. Murphy, and uh, she pocket vetoed it. So if uh, for example, State Senator Scott Bennett had added himself as a co-sponsor um, that that could have avoided it, but there's also some uh, statutory, but there's some procedural limitations that could have prevented him from doing that. But we need to make sure that this is on his radar too. 
Okay, I think we are, that's covered very well. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for that. Thank you. We're going to go on now to uh, public participation. And I'm looking to see, we have two individuals who've raised their hands at this point. I know it looks like it's one person. Uh, Colin Dodson, you could um, participate. Hi, yes, um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, there are just two points I wanted to raise in connection with uh, utility shutoffs. Uh, one is on the point of, um, you know, the amount of power that municipal governments can have to prevent uh, utility disconnections. This being said, um, this is anecdotal information. I'm not entirely sure how this is enforced or what the difference in the environment in terms of how much power municipalities have between New York State and Illinois is. But I can say that Geneva, Illinois has actually passed a, an indefinite moratorium on utility shutoffs for non-payment. So it is something that you know municipalities can do assuming that there is nothing at the state level to prevent it. Um, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, while it's great that there's uh, substantial aid available in order to help folks um, pay back due rent and utility debt, the honestly, the as we're looking at a pandemic, this is a collective problem. It is a public health problem. It's not just an individual problem. So as well intentioned as these programs are, any kind of application process in front of it is a barrier, which is going to limit the effectiveness of you know, these countermeasures where the simplest thing to ensure the best uh, public health outcome is simply to stop the utility shutoffs in the first place, to disallow uh, the utility companies, which as Alan said, are regulated as public utilities, to stop them from disconnecting in the first place as a blanket without requiring any initial action on the part of any individual. Because the thing is when someone goes, you know, has their water shut off and is unable to maintain proper hygiene, that doesn't just impact them, it impacts the entire community because that becomes a, a, a source for spread of a disease. And that's true uh, just as much with, you know, the flu and the common cold as it is with COVID-19. It's just that this pandemic has raised the importance of, um, you know, these underlying concerns and issues, what I would call human rights, positive human rights, you know, housing, water, food, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that for people to, to stay safe and to keep their communities safe under no conditions should water or power be shut off for non-payment. Thank you very much, Colin. The next individual, Ami English, or Amy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, this is Amy Jandusa English. I work for Cub. I was invited on by Scott. Um, I just had a couple of quick clarifying questions um, and I'm, I'm sitting here holding up three fingers so I don't forget what my three things are that I wanna ask. <laughs> Um, okay. Number one, for the for the uh, most recent speaker, I'd, I'd like to clarify the village of Geneva in Illinois, they have a municipal electric department. So if they were passing an ordinance to ban uh, disconnections, it would have been related to their own utility operations. It wouldn't have anything to do with um, uh, investor owned utilities. Geneva would be in the service territory of NICOR Gas. NICOR Gas has been abiding by the disconnection moratorium. That I just crunched the latest disconnection numbers and they haven't done any disconnection numbers. So it is true that um, that leads into my second point. Some, there, and, there was- And Amy, I, I, think, I think my note said that he was talking about Geneva, but I thought it was New York. Am I wrong? I don't know. I, I was a little confused about that. I don't know where Geneva, New York is, but- Okay, thank you very much. Continue. Um, and so going on to the disconnection moratorium and the disconnection numbers that Alan um, so expertly highlighted. Yes, there was a moratorium that was passed in the fall 
And the IC, the Illinois Commerce Commission declined, as Scott said, to enforce the moratorium. They said that without uh, input from the governor's office, without pressure from the General Assembly, basically, they would um, they didn't feel like they had the authority to order the utilities. But what they did was they kind of like pressured them into agreeing to a voluntary moratorium. But I think the real crime here is that that quote unquote voluntary moratorium is being implemented very differently by different companies. So we know that um, People's Gas, North Shore Gas and NICOR Gas have not done any disconnections whatsoever. And then you have other companies like ComEd that did some disconnections and then backed off and decided not to do any more for a while. The, the most egregious thing that's happening right now is that Illinois American water has been on like a disconnection bonanza. So they did, they just, they disconnected a bunch of people in December and they just released their January disconnection numbers. And it looks to me like they just, well, we know they disconnected over 3000 people and you can sort those, uh, you can look at those zip codes where the disconnections took place. Um, and so what, what I think is important is that where the city of Urbana and local municipalities can come in, you can exert political pressure on the utility companies themselves because we have the political structure with the Commerce Commission and the General Assembly, um, whatever work can be done to get, to build support for extending the morator moratorium across the board. But on behalf of the city of Urbana, you can certainly reach out to um, Illinois American Waters public relations team and ask them, why are they doing so many disconnections? Their behavior as a company is counter to what all the other companies are doing. So I think to me, that's the biggest red flag. And that's what I really wanted to uh, enter into the record today is that I think Illinois American water is behaving in a very anomalous and especially threatening way. Thank you very much. Good, good points. All right, um, next, James Corburn, would you like to speak? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just got, I got two issues. Uh, well, not two issues, just two concerns I'm going to talk about. And I want to, I want to first lead off with a little bit about, uh, what Mayor Marlin, the number that she just, uh, you know, gave out, which is great. Cause I've been having conversations with landlords, private landlords, and they are finding it very difficult and to get these services, because like you said, a lot of these depend on the tenants applying for them, which is somewhat of a barrier. And I think this is great news that I could take back to these landlords and let them know that they can apply for the tenants because uh, that would then actually open the door up for uh, a lot of other assistants. Some of these landlords are actually sort of reluctant on taking on new tenants at this time because of this issue. And, you know, it's something that that needs to be addressed. And I think we need to either get a, a flyer out or maybe first followers could help bring this, you know, to them uh, to, to get this issue out further, because we're going to have to do something. We're going to run into a, another we're going to hit another wall as far as helping individuals. And this is something that's going to be another um just another concern stacked on another concern at this time right now doing this whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we all experiencing at this time. And I, I just like to thank you for that number. So I will share that with the landlords I know, but it, uh, if there's somewhere like a flyer or something or somewhere you could direct me where I could find out more information, do I get this from RPC or you know, where, where can I, where can I find this at so I can distribute it? I can put it on social media and share it as well. I would like to know that. And um, my, my second thing I just want to say was uh, on behalf of first followers, I would just like to take the time, a brief city council for passing our proposal, uh, which is the welcome home package to help our returning citizens get reestablished back into the community. Uh, 
during this time, I know the COVID-19 and we are seeing freezing weather, freezing temperatures at this time, as well as sustainable employment, we are running into some serious issues out here. Uh, First Followers team is one that's got boots on the ground in the community. And this is what we do. This, I guess we the closest thing that you got to a 24 uh, seven response team that could get out there at this time, which is something that we need to probably uh, develop in the near future, very, very near future. Seeing such issues as people, uh, utilities being turned off heat and other things. So, and um, that's, that's pretty much all I want to say on that. I just like to thank you guys at this time of crisis for passing that proposal. That's all. Okay, thank you very much. All right, next individual will be Christopher Hansen. Would you like to speak, please? Hey, Dennis, can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Hansen. I live in Urbana. Um, Tonight, I wanted to talk about uh, item number nine on your agenda, the ordinance amendings code chapter 12. Uh, so I'm glad to see, I guess this is the second time this is coming to the committee and I'm glad to see a more complete picture is being presented instead of just leaving out information that the city administration doesn't find uh, desirable. Um, it does seem like the city administrator is poised to frame this issue almost entirely as a financial issue. Um, I, I think the ethical issue on this is is pretty obvious. I mean, the city of Urbana should be bound by the same human rights laws as as everyone else. Um, so this is this is going to be presented, I think, as a as a, a financial issue. Um, and I, when we talk about money, uh, the responsible economist always asks, you know, compared to what? When you present a cost, you say compared to what? Um, and in this situation, I think the discussion the council ought to have is what is the cost of ignoring misconduct? Um, does that come free to the, to the city or does that cost us something? And I wonder if we might take the example of like the, the Alea Lewis arrest back in April. And uh, I think what we saw there, although almost no one, no one in the city is willing to admit it, we saw police misconduct. And then we saw the city try over and over and over and over to ignore and deny that there was any misconduct. Now, um, that that allegation, those allegations of misconduct did not go through an official city process. It didn't go through our CPRB. There were complaints submitted to the CPRB, but those were uh, denied or delayed because uh, the city legal wants to do it that way. Um, but did it still come free to us to just to ignore it? I don't think so. I, I was doing some back of the napkin uh, numbers the other day, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the city ran up half a million or a million dollars in, in costs and burdens because of that one incident. I mean, if you think of all the hours and staff time, the public input, everything that, that revolved that, I mean, it, it kind of crushed, crushed the city's uh, throughput for a good portion of 2020. So, um, and, and remember the, the, if Alea Lewis is a, thinks she was um, something uh, if her rights were violated, the courts are at her disposal, right? So we can we can say we can sit here and pretend that oh, there's another venue, um, but did it matter, or did, or did it still cost the city all the same? So we're looking at at the Urbana human rights laws, and the question is, uh, do we want to clearly include the city of Urbana under this ordinance, or do we want to exempt them so that um, if someone working for the city uh, violates the human rights laws, they can't be held accountable to our human rights laws. And so that's the question before you. Uh, and I think it, it should be clear, the, the, the first people, the first entity, the first employer that should be included in those laws is the city of Urbana. So uh, I just, I can't see exempting them as, as being proposed. Um, I would also like, I hope someone will ask why the city attorney never invoked chapter two, article nine of the city code, which already contemplates conflicts of interest and the hiring of outside attorneys. Uh, it seems like some of the problems that are being proposed are already contemplated in our code. Um, and I don't, I don't, I didn't see that referred to. And I also want to remind the council that we do have an ethics code uh, in our city code. And that applies to, it actually applies to all of you, elected officials, council members, board members. It applies to all city employees and department heads. Basically everyone working for the city is bound by this ethics code and you can be fined uh, up to $750 for violating this code. 
So uh, the, the conflicts that are being proposed here, uh, does that mean we can't apply it, we can't use our ethics code ever, ever either because it's just too untenable to hold ourselves accountable? Um, thanks. Thanks, Christopher. All right, next person, uh, Tracy Chong, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Tracy Chong from Urbana. Um, regarding the resolution providing um, that talks about um, technical de-escalation and transparency, maybe we should ask ourselves um, whether if this resolution was in place before UPD police officers beat up Aliyah Lewis, would the police officers have been held accountable? Or would the outcome still have been the same? Because like the language in the ordinance, like, like the language in the resolution, it all comes down to appropriateness. Could Sergeant Coker still say that his actions were appropriate? How about the taser incident from 2019 that I have been mentioning over and over again? Would this resolution or even the updates in the use of policy have prevented it? Would the use of force reports and even having a civilian on the use of force committee pre have prevented it. Um, somehow I doubt it, because keep in mind, this taser case was revealed by the CPRB, um, comprised of all civilians and no one found any misconduct. Why? Because Deputy Chief Sells hid the critical video footage from them. Um, what's the point of a review board if the evidence presented is not complete? And who's keeping track of the evidence that's presented? It all boils down to the rotten core of UPD leadership. A police chief that doesn't hold his personnel accountable and is incapable of issuing an apology. A deputy chief who selectively shows or hides taser cam footage from a review board. And another example, when looking to purchase, purchase gas masks, our deputy chief souls knew that based on the amount that they were going to spend, UPD would need to follow the proper channels of advertising and asking for written bids. But it seems like Searles wanted to push for the deal to be done before the November elections so that they could bypass purchasing regulations based on exigency. If this is how our police department leadership thinks, what's the use of talking about transparency? Speaking of leadership, this, the leadership of our city matters too. How can we hold the UPD to a certain standard when we have a mayor that has been caught telling the public inaccurate information to suit certain narratives? We have not heard any apology from her. Regarding the HRC's jurisdiction over the city, based on Carol Mitten's memo and analysis of the issue, it seems that the choice of what to do has now come down to cost. Is basing decisions on just the number Carol Mitten gave the right thing to do? Are we being short-sighted to make decision, decisions just based on the numbers she provided? What is the cost to the city when we put aside ethics when making decisions? That aside, I'm very curious about the number Carol Mitten gave. She cited $17,000 for the hiring of Deanna Moole for the electoral board hearing. I was pretty shocked to hear that number. Carol Mitten also said the cost may increase to, due to PAC appeals. Um, can anyone clarify why? As far as I know, the hearing officer has not been involved in any PAC appeals. Um, it was city attorney, James Simon, who has been the attorney responding to PAC appeals. Um, maybe if you're gonna put out some numbers, I think some clarification to the public should be given. And I hope um, any of you city council members or city staff can address these questions. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Next. Ellen Max Axelrod. Are you coming uh, back thanks. on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I've got a few things to address. Can I see the clock real quick? Thank you. There it is. Uh, so I was asked by a member of No Ammon Shutoffs to specifically point out the water shutoff numbers in uh, Urbana that I had glossed over. Um, this past month of January, there were 92 water shutoffs. Um, the month before, there were 125 water shutoffs. Uh, sorry, I'm reading the, uh, sorry, uh, 125 was for Champaign County. 
68 water shutoffs in December. Um, the, the main thing that's important to realize here is that uh, roughly one out of every, um, what is it, uh, 30 households that were shut off in December were in Urbana. And we've got a very similar percentage uh, for January as well. And uh, I hope that this program um, helps to uh, stymie the, the shutoffs. Um, I, I'm, I'm not uh, optimistic about anything that's not automatic um, myself. Uh, any sort of Fortune 500 company that is worth their salt will contract with companies specifically to reduce the steps and to streamline the process of point of sale transactions so that they can increase their profits. We don't do that when it comes to social services. And that's why we need to try to fight for uh, things as automatic as possible because someone who doesn't complete that customer conversion in air quotes, um, that's not somebody who doesn't give you money. That's somebody whose life is ruined. Um, the other things that I wanted to address uh, relating to the agenda tonight we have to remember what Police Chief Serafin said about a gun being present and that being the reason why de-escalation was inappropriate in his opinion. If this whenever possible phrase in that resolution is used to justify that same behavior, we are no better now than we were then in addressing the inciting incident. So please explicitly have an amendment to the resolution mentioning the presence of the gun and that not disqualifying de-escalation as a priority. The other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, gaslighting. There's a pattern of behavior and it usually goes like this. I'm going to, in some way that you can't trace, or in some way using innocuous statements, say something that is grievously upsetting to someone else. They lash out, and then I go, aha, got you. That is basically a callous description of gaslighting. I mention this specifically because there's still quite a lot of harm done to people who have been gaslit by powerful people, and those powerful people then use the victim's response to try to flip the roles. No matter how many media reports there are, that damage will not be undone until there is responsibility accepted and that there is a restorative justice process done. Anybody trying to say that this is cancellation is perpetuating the dynamics that led to a lot of unpleasant events. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your input. Next, Grace Wilkin, please. You may speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Grace Wilkin and I'm a resident of Urbana. And I wanted to uh, echo a lot of the previous speakers and just speak on a few agenda items for tonight. Um, I hope that you approve the resolution 006R to share grant money with first followers. Uh, I think this is a great step. First followers is a wonderful organization um, that's picking up the slack from our failed system, which offers no resources to people who are released from prison or jail and then are discriminated against for housing and employment. So our system sends people into this vicious cycle with no resources. And First Followers and other organizations are picking up the slack and doing amazing work. So I'm glad that we're sharing some of these structural resources um, and I'd like to see more. You know, We shouldn't be in this situation in the first place. I think it also ties into item number nine, resolution ending in 003 about Urbana being exempt from its own human rights ordinance um, and the decision that its human rights board makes. 
I think that by discriminating on criminal record, you are not only defying Urbana's own ordinance, but also perpetuating the broken cycle of recidivism and denying employment to members of our community who already served their time and could offer unique and diverse skills and perspectives. So I think that um, it's ironic to even have both of these on the same agenda item today that you will um, potentially discriminate against people for a criminal record while supposedly supporting first followers and denying your own human rights ordinance. Um, I see a lot of hypocrisy in that. On the item for de-escalation, um, I think that that's definitely important. De-escalation is key in staying calm in intense and heated situations. I'm concerned that any changes to the police code or training won't be effective unless there's true accountability and changes to the way that we um, overall structure the system and the way that police interact with certain members of our community. Um, again, please listen to our other community members as we have a lot to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, Lena Andrus Walker, it'll be your turn, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Lena. I'm a resident of Urbana, Ward 5. Um, I just wanted to give a very general public comment about the presentation earlier on utility shutoffs. Um, I, I think I may have said this in public comment before, but I'd like to, to say it again, just that, um, you know, I, I used to work for a utility company and also for various social services. I definitely appreciate everything that CCRPC does, um, and especially having that number out in the community to know that people can get hooked up with services and, and that there is funding available. At the same time, having worked um, for a utility company in a customer service department, I, I'm very familiar with the not so rosy picture of the reality of people trying to prevent their services from getting cut off and kind of acting as the conduit, excuse me, a lot of the times between people that were concerned about their utilities being shut off and the various social services organizations that had the ability to give them some temporary funding. It's an exhaustive process. And a lot of the people that I would work with, I, I would see um, you know, consistently. It was not a one-time issue. There are people for whom it's just a temporary thing, but a lot of the times like paying back rent, paying back utilities, you know, the, the, there's a more serious underlying problem, which is that there's there's not the funds to do it from month to month anyways. The cost of rent or the cost of utilities is untenable for many people. So it's great that there's funding, but there, there's a deeper problem that's not getting solved. And I mean, the reason I bring this up as well is that, you know, I, I'm a planning student and I've been doing a lot of research on past comprehensive plans for both Urbana and Champaign. I think about uh, local governmental systems a lot, and, and I'm hoping I'll, you know, I'll work for one someday in some capacity. So I definitely understand that there are limitations for a local government body, you know, budget, time, staffing, these are all very real limitations. But in a more general sense, I really hope that the people that are elected to this body and that all the staff at the city can continue to think about these issues and discuss them. You know, recognize the limitations, but don't, that doesn't mean that you should just brush it off as like, okay, well, we can't do anything about this, so it's not our problem. Because how we frame issues is really critical. You know, and as public service employees, we can't always control our funding or other things, but we do have a say in what we choose to prioritize and how we choose to frame stuff. And I'm thinking about this, especially in terms of the Imagine Urbana plan, because, you know, comprehensive planning is all about framing values, right? And if framing values can't really affect things, then what does that say about comprehensive planning as a process? and all of the work of community engagement that goes into it. So I, I, I just wanted to just sort of share that perspective on that and that I hope we can do everything within our power, both governmentally and as a community to make sure that folks are staying safe in this pandemic and not getting their utilities shut off and looking at the deeper problems in the long-term for how to prevent these issues from happening at all. Thank you. Thank you. And okay, the individual, Rita, your turn, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Rita Connery. I am a resident. I reside in Champaign. And I just want to take a moment of silence for the overload of white fragility and complicit colors that have been 
limited in at last week's meeting and since. I want, also want to acknowledge Huey Newton, happy birthday. I want to thank the previous speakers that spoke as it relates to some of their concerns tonight. I agree um, with many of our citizens. Uh, First Followers does not receive the credit due. They are servicing, as James stated, from the, from the ground. Um, but however, back to my comment, what has been on public display recently is counter to what the city of Urbana's mission statement is about. Instead, what has escalated over the last week of immature behavior, similar to a temper tantruming toddler that was rooted from hurt feelings by fragility. To have public elected officials act in an unethical manner and escalated tactics, exerting privilege through their white power. If people are paying attention, the white fragility that has been on display does not align with Urbana and should not be rewarded in the communities of Urbana. All people of color need to understand how detrimental white fragility is in our local government. It can result in one's need not being met as a result of focusing on personal feelings and emotions over public issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we, have, what we have done is watch specific professionals act in a way that has exhibited a lack of understanding and promoted similar behaviors that are a disservice to people of color. Further, these same professionals have failed to use their privilege and authority to promote acceptance of people of color into the fold of what services are offered and failed to demonstrate a collective collaboration with community members blocking black people out of spaces by using code racist words similar to those of the police, such as aggressive, threatening, bullying, bullying and etc., shows a lack of cultural competence and a need for further instruction and development in their ability to intercept. What is not being shared is the other forms of white intimidation that is being used to control the narrative, which truly is a representation of bullying, aggressiveness, and intimidation. This speaks volumes when it comes to socialization and interaction with people of color. If I am truthfully, if I am truthfully to state an opinion, then I am going to be reprimanded by the, possible, by the possibility of not receiving benefits or assistance because of their profession. That is not, that is right, that, their perception of me raising my voice or too aggressive. This is a failure to acknowledge affirmative action in politics and possibly giving us an image in how um, some of our elected officials interact with people of color. This is not about stroking one's ego for the work that they have done within the community. This should be the opportunity to accept the diverse opinion and reflect on and, re, and reflect respectfully with those with difference of opinions within our community. These spaces in Champaign-Urbana have been promoted for progressive black candidates, but when assessing, and when you look around, many of the offices are actually held by many white men and women. By the way, those of you that are aspiring to be like this unnamed professional, it seems that you too are choosing to take on white fragility, learning how to throw temper tantrums and not accepting the differences of opinion of people of color. Know that these behaviors are also contributing to the systemic issues here in Urbana. I would just like to know that there was a young lady today. Thank you. Your time mom. is coming to a close. Thank you. Okay, I believe the last person is Justin Hendricks. Can you all hear me? We do. Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Michael Hendricks, Champaign-Urbana resident, Parkland College student, creative hidden homeboy. Please donate to our pantries around Champaign-Urbana, especially during the cold season, season and COVID time. Uh, we are thankful to have a pantry in collaboration with First Followers at the Louisiana location. Personally, to see the work firsthand from Mr. James to Mr. Tiger and the others in the program is impactful and has created a change and an opening door of opportunities for the recently incarcerated, even to see the youth and the Black boys having skills and resources put in their hands 
instead of disparities is something very impactful to see. Moving along, I believe that there comes a time to which situations must be addressed. Nonetheless, that time is not now for me or in my now. I respectfully will say my words are my words and no one else's, whether I have supported, commented, or mentioned a person. I respectfully won't focus on an isolated situation to overshadow the actual problems that we must eradicate besides privilege. And that is homelessness, food, secu food, sec food insecurity, and violence of all kinds. The city must be ensuring access, support, and resources to our most vulnerable and impoverished communities and neighborhoods. Last week, it was a young black queer girl who was in need. This week, it's a family who has a child with a medical condition to which she can't stay in a shelter. Thank you to those street warriors and street advocates who stepped in and showed out in contributions to make sure we show community culture. Rita Connolly, thank you not only for pushing cars in the snow, but pushing out the services to the people. Alan, thank you for the work you've been doing with the no, no utility shutoffs to uh, canceling rent debts. They are amazing to know that people are taking their personal time to focus on the people's first problem with housing inequalities and more. In closing, in closing, Hidden Homeboy has three final episodes of My Black Mental Health uh, this Tuesday and Thursday where we'll be discussing adults over 40, uh, black, uh, black women and sisterhood. Also uh, on February 26th, we'll be doing the Don Moore Boys and Girls Club Black History Trivia. So please make sure you come out and support our black organizations and our youth organizations. We'll be giving out cash prizes, gift cards, and sweet treats, plus a DJ to keep the culture going. We will live stream the event as well for those to cheer on their favorite organizations. Uh, organizations include the Goal Getters, Hope Op Operation Hope, I in Mount Olive Church and many others. With that being said, I am Justin Michael Hendricks, the People's Mayor. I will see you all tomorrow night at the People's Council. Thank you. Take care. And good night. As we use these last minutes to make sure that we acknowledge the voices of the Black songs unheard and those in the streets who are making sure that we are making the spaces. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. I believe that's the last uh, request for um, public input. This evening, I do not see any more. That was myself. Not somebody was not knocking at the door of the city council building. Um, then, therefore, we shall go on to uh, the agenda as provided to us. So, first, we need a staff report. Will there be a staff report this evening, Carol? Please go ahead. I have just a couple of things. One is um, just following up on the conversation from the, I think it was the last meeting about emulsicote. We have been working with the folks from the um, Environmental Justice uh, Office in um, IEPA, and we are collecting some information both um, from emulsicote themselves and also we've, um, I think I had mentioned that, that we've done a FOIA of, um, some of their reporting with IEPA. And so we'll be collecting that. And I've, uh, we, ha we haven't gotten anything yet um, from our FOIA, but we, uh, we will, we will um, put that in a place where the public can access it. And then at the April 6th meeting of the Sustainability Advisory Committee, um, the folks from the IEPA will be there to explain um, they're, you know, explain these reports. They'll bring some technical folks. I've invited the folks from Emulsicote, but um, that'll be an opportunity for people to have a dialogue about their concerns and, and what, uh, what the reports mean that we hope to be getting. Um, so I wanted people to put that on their calendar so they can attend. And then, um, you know, uh, staff has been thinking about, you know, we, we, we will for sure have some new council members and we have some, uh, we have folks that um, maybe didn't get the full range of um, training um, that, that may be returning. Um, but we, what we wanna do is start doing some council training and the amount of uh, training that we wanna do is, uh, we, we don't wanna wait until the elections take place. We wanna get started. It's all to the good of the public as well. So starting on March 1st, um, we, we have, we have, a, we have a, um, we're working on a, a schedule, but starting on March 1st, we will, we will start, a, a, we will have a public meeting uh, starting at six o'clock, so from six to seven prior to the um, council or committee meeting, whatever's happening that night. And um, we'll have a session about a topic uh, so that we can start to, um, you know, just get people understanding how the government works. And uh, members of the public will be welcome to attend, but in order to keep to the hour time, the only people that will be allowed in as panelists to ask questions and so forth will be either sitting council members or candidates for 
um, public office in Urbana. So um, just something to put on your radar screen uh, going forward. And that's what I have for staff report tonight. I don't know if the mayor has anything. I do. Do you? I do. Just okay. to follow Diana up Martin. on uh, just to follow up on James Corbin's comments about uh, getting the word out to landlords, I wanted to let folks know that RPC and our staff and staff of other um, municipalities <clears throat> did hold a meeting with, I believe they said they had about 30 landlords attending, some of the larger landlords especially, to let them know about the funding that's available for rent and utility assistance. And I've also had a, a meeting with a couple of landlords as well, which first alerted me to the to the cascading impact of um, people being behind in rent. It means that um, property owners are not getting the income that they expected, which then has an impact on their ability to pay their mortgages. And one of the things that we wanna, two of the things we wanna prevent is one, we wanna prevent people from losing their housing. We wanna keep them in their homes, but we also want to prevent people from losing their properties, which would lead to foreclosures. And then a whole other set of problems, which we saw you know, in the great recession of 2008 and 2009. So, so this program is good for both the renter and the property owners. And we are, they are making a concerted outreach to um, landlords, but yeah, anything you can do to get the word out to other property owners is really important. I see a question from Bill Brown. Um, yeah, I mean, we do have the rental registration program, so we should have a pretty big list of landlords, and that would include a lot of small landlords that might not hear about it otherwise. So right. anyway, we could make a flyer and, and uh, distribute it to those people on our rental registration list. Yep, very easily. You can send an email. Yep. Okay, thanks. Other comment? Okay, great. Thanks for those reports. Uh, the first item of action tonight is uh, resolution number 2021-02-006R, a resolution approving a City of Urbana Community Development Block Grant Program Agreement with First Followers Welcome Home Program. And we can have a presentation from uh, Kat or somebody in community development, is that correct? Who would like to lead this discussion? I think this Sheila is, she is going to be handling that. There she is. Yeah, Who this is, is Sheila. Sheila, um, okay, Sheila Dodd, right. Yeah. Um, some you. of you may remember that first followers approached the city um, uh, the middle of winter asking for funding for their first followers welcome home program. Um, they have a unique group of clients that kind of fall in the crack of getting assistance for homelessness because the way that the homeless is defined is someone who didn't have a bed to sleep in the night before, but with people who are incarcerated, they had a place to stay. So finding funding to help them and uh, these clients and, and help them get on their feet and get a fresh start has been difficult. So they've requested funding um, from the city for $20,600 for their welcome home program. Um, the program will offer uh, case management services um, to help them have access to a variety, variety of things such as um, how to fill out a job application, um, get your driver's license or, or photo ID, those type of things. Um, it'll have a welcome home package, which is a backpack filled with essential needs um, and then some fresh clothing. Um, it'll provide housing assistance. So if they need assistance with rent or getting on their, their feet with um, any type of housing down payment, they'll have access to that. And then it also provides a cell phone so that they can apply for jobs and have access to getting return calls. So um, it's a very much needed program. Um, Champagne has provided uh, the same type of funding for Champaign residents. And so Urbana would like to provide the same for those wanting to reside in Urbana. Um, they estimate that they'll serve about 12 clients with this funding. Very good. Other questions uh, concerning the presentation there? Okay, we could have a discussion or whatever. Yes, Eric Sachs, I saw your hand go up. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. So um, the estimate was serving uh, 12, I guess, what's, what's the projected need? Um, the need is, is that, I mean, it's probably greater than, than 12, but they're estimating with this program just launching that, that they should be able to assist 12, 10 to 12 people in the city of Urbana. These are people who are being released from the prison system, some early because of COVID and some just because their incarceration term has ended and um, they're needing help to get back on their feet. And I saw first um, Mary Alice Wu. Did you have a hand up? I, I did have a hand up. I just wanted so that we could have discussion uh, to put a motion on the floor to move resolution number 2021-02006R, resolution approving a city of Urbana community development block grant program agreement with first followers welcome home program uh, to city council with a recommendation for approval. I'll second. I'll second. I think that Bill Brown beat you there, Cherise. <laughs> okay. But well, well played nonetheless. Uh, all right, we have we have um, a first uh, a motion and a seconding. Uh, and we did uh, so. Continue. Dennis, we did ask that this be put on a consent agenda. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. Bill, did you do that? As for a consent agenda, or staff did. St staff made the recommendation. Yes. Yeah, I, I did not, but I was going to suggest that myself because I think this is probably going to have overwhelming support. Sure. Okay. Yeah. okay. And I'm so, happy to amend that to put it on the consent agenda. All right. And Bill, do you agree with that? Yep. Okay. All right. Consent agenda. Is there a discussion here? Yes. Mary Alice. Um, I just wanted to say that the, during the uh, social service grant funding uh, round from this last year, there were some questions in terms of why first followers wasn't awarded money at that time. And uh, Sheila had brought to our attention that there was a possibility of funding through CDBG um, that would meet their needs. And so I know that Sheila's been working really hard to see this to fruition. I just wanna thank Sheila for, for bringing this to us. Um, and I wanted to let the public know uh, kind of the relationship that we had with the social service funding as well. That's good background, thank you. And we, we are continuing to work with first followers to receive home funding um, for their new housing, rental housing that they're working on and plan to bring that to council for review um, in March. Okay, so that's for gonna be very good. Other comments or questions? All right, Let's seeing, oh yes, Bill Goldberg. Yeah, I just wanna make a couple comments. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with First Followers. They're an um, excellent group of, um, of individuals from our community who are trying to, um, you know, to help um, you know, some of our residents that, uh, that are in need. Um, I became familiar with them through my involvement in the community coalition, and I can't say enough uh, positive things about them. And then also to address the question of the need. Uh, part of my professional background uh, for four years I was an independent contractor and I interacted with hundreds of felons returning from the Department of Corrections. Um, I did this in addition, uh, in addition to uh, my day job. And I cannot tell you how many young men and women that I met over a four year period who came back to absolutely nothing. I have been in more homes that I can count that didn't have a single piece of furniture, no clothing, no food. They got released from prison. They did their time. They paid their debt to society. Um, some of them admitted to their mistakes. Some of them didn't, but it didn't matter to me. Fact is they were back out in the community and they didn't need to get uh, reintegrated into the community. Um, I've had some of the most blessed conversations and relationships from those interactions that I can even um, recount. So the fact that we've got a group here locally that is seeking a grant in order to help people in our community to get reintegrated into the community uh, is a positive thing and I cannot give uh, enough support for this. Well spoken. 
right. I think we can, oh yes, Eric. So I, I just wanna clarify my question. I, I clearly see that there is a need. It seemed like 12 was a rather small number. So I was just wondering how big a need is there? Uh, and what proportion of the need does this meet? Sounds like the needs are very large. Yeah, and it's it's a difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> um, I'm guessing that that 12 to 15 is a minimum, but you know it's an ever changing population. Uh, our funds can only be used for those in the city of Urbana. Champagne's funds can only be used for the city of Champagne residents, and as we know, this this population as well as our homeless homeless population cross back and forth streets. So. Um, we'll work closely with first followers um, to see, you know, if they need other additional funding as time goes on. But uh, I think there is a great need, as Bill pointed out. Okay. Any other question? All right. Uh, let's have the, the clerk call the roll for this consent agenda item. Council Member Wu. Yes. Fax. Yes. Percy. Yes. Brown. Yes. Roberts? Yes. Holbrook? Yes. Okay, that passes. And that will go to our next meeting. Next is ordinance number 2021-02-004, an ordinance annexing certain territory to the city of Urbana, specifically 2005 North Willow Road. And for uh, this item, we have Somebody from community development also, would that be? Rita, oh, Kate, Kat. I will be presenting tonight, yes. Hi, everybody. And I have a short presentation as well. Very good. Um, Michelle and William Scott are petitioning to annex 2005 North Willow Road into the city of Urbana so that they're within the city's fire response service area. Uh, the property is contiguous to the city on the south side and no, no new sewer connection will be required. Uh, staff recommends that the committee of the whole recommend approval of the proposed ordinance and place emplacement on the consent agenda. And um, one question that we are working to address um, before we get into discussion is how will this annexation affect the property across the street um, which is 2006 North Willow Road. Oops. Um, yes, I asked that. Yes, and the question was, um, would the city be able to force annexation of this property? Um, the city could force annexation, but the property does not have to, or we do not have to force annexation um, if we don't pursue that. Uh, forcing annexation may require court action, which is why we would like to encourage um, annexation if possible. Um, and then there are also costs associated with um, annexing parcels into the city. Uh, and because this property is already developed, it might be a higher cost than if the property were undeveloped. Um, and I can take any other questions you guys have now. I ask that because my, my understanding is that when a when an annexation completes the circling, uh, the circumference, not circling, I don't know, surrounding of, of the uh, of a parcel by uh, completing completing the uh, circle around a parcel of, of city properties, the, uh, the the property that's enclosed is uh, liable for annexation. So, I mean, whether they are, whether it's actually annexed or not may be a discussion that you have with the property owner. Uh, and what you're su suggesting is that the city would not forcibly do the, an annexation, but it could potentially discuss an annexation agreement with that property. Yes, and we did have some internal conversation um, about 2006 Willow. Um, we had talked about um, bringing that property to review by the annexation review team. Um, and we also talked about having potentially having a neighborhood meeting for other parcels in this area mm -hmm. uh, to encourage annexation if they're interested. What are the, uh, what are the benefits that you could offer those individuals? Um, among the, I think the most 
pertinent benefits to those properties would be fire protection, um, school, once you annex, you're also in the city, um, it, as far as school district goes, um, public library, things like that. Um, but 2005 North Willow is annexing primarily for fire, to be in the fire protection uh, of the city, not the Eastern Prairie Fire Protection District. I see, okay. So good luck with that then. Are there questions? Okay, I don't see any raised hand. Um, a motion? Sharice. Um, yes, I'd like to move to uh, include with the consent agenda, ordinance number 2021-02-004, an ordinance annexing certain territory to, to the city of Urbana, 2005 North Willow Road for the approval in a uh, consent agenda. I'll second it. Thank you, Bill. Are there, is there other discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Okay, would that be yourself? Would you want to uh, do the roll call for this consent agenda item? Yes. Well, I'm oh, back. You're back. Good. I'm back now. Okay, a shift of uh, <laughs> personnel back there. Okay, I'm... Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Colbrook? Yes. Okay, that passes and will appear on our consent agenda at our next meeting. Next is resolution number 2021-02-007R, a resolution prioritizing tactical de-escalation in the use of force policy and police transparency in Urbana. This uh, was brought to council's attention by council members Wu and Hersey. Would one of you like to um, do a presentation at this time? Uh, I'd be happy to review it. Fine. I don't have a formal presentation, but I'd be happy to talk about it. Just to introduce it, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. Um, I want to thank Sharice for supporting it. And we had a conversation in terms of the resolution that she wanted to work on. I wanted something tangible um, that we could use as a a guiding post for us to direct staff and to basically say that city council stands behind the principles of de-escalation being a priority. Um, I also wanted us to talk about like how use of force is actually being used in our, in our police department. And so that's one of the reasons why after Bill suggested a, a police for annual police report, I thought that this would be a good opportunity to not only include an annual police report, but also to look and see how many use of force cases do we have that come before the board? Um, what are the results of those use of force cases? Because at the moment, I don't think that city council nor the public has any idea in terms of how frequently these things occur or what types of actions occur after the use of force board. Um, the other item is, is I think it's important, the city of Champaign has a civilian on the use of force committee. And I had spoken to the chief about it a while ago and he had said he supported it. So I thought it would be a good opportunity for city council to weigh in on this um, and talk about that. So those are kind of my rationales for why I wanted to move forward with this ordinance at this time. And sorry, resolution, my bad. Um, there have been some questions that have arisen. I did wanna say that this is not to take away from all the work that's going on in the use of force policy. That's a lot of the details. Um, there is a lot of, I know there's conversation right now at the city level with the ACLU and the NAACP and that is definitely, those discussions should continue and um, be rigorous. So I, I just wanted to make the point that this is basically saying city council prioritizes de-escalation in the use of force policy. Um, but that all those details should be figured out amongst uh, city staff and some of the other um, constituencies that are working hard with city staff on that. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, chief of, sorry, the city administrator, Carol Mitten, also the chief of police for um, their support in this. It means a lot that we have staff support as well as hopefully community support. 
Um, the items that have been brought to my attention for uh, further discussion have been primarily around um, how this civilian would be chosen. Um, and uh, so I, I'd be open to a conversation about that. I didn't go into a lot of details with that. Um, I also did want to bring up the idea of the review of the use of force policy. I think that we are all very acutely aware that it's been quite some time since the city has gone through that review process. And I wanted to have some guidelines in terms of how frequently we expect it to be reviewed. Um, the five years is just a guideline. It is not something that says that we can't review it beforehand. If something comes up, something comes to our attention that we really need to address beforehand. Um, but this basically puts an end point of five years. It needs to be looked at at least every five years, if not sooner. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about it. Uh, yeah, and I'd like to share that uh, I, we did receive a, a comment by, by uh, uh, Jared Miller, who's not here, but he did uh, share concerns and I just will read his one paragraph quickly. My one question, said Jared, should everyone find section two amenable is about who shall be appointed to, as a civilian or non-government employee to the use of force board. It would be preferential if language was included to clarify who makes the appointment and that either the council or the CPRB should make or at least approve the appointment if the appointment is to be brought forward by the mayor. I would appreciate everyone's consideration of clarifying the process and adding a measure of involvement to the appointment, whether high or low uh, to the process for council or the CPRB. So those were his concerns. Okay, Bill Hol Holbrook, I see your hand. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, and just for the record. Oh, uh, maybe we should have a motion, I guess. I guess we should have a motion before we discuss. Um, I can make a motion then. Please do then. Uh, I'll move resolution number 2021-02007R, resolution prioritizing tactical de-escalation in the use of force policy and police transparency in Urbana with a recommendation for approval to city council. A second. Cersei seconds it. Okay, now discussion. Bill Colebrook. Yeah, just a question, I guess this is for the mayor. Um, uh, or the city attorney or whoever wants to answer. Um, so to Councilman Miller's question about, um, you know, what involvement the city council should have or the, um, or any other body. Uh, I see this as a, um, an appointment that the civilian to the use of uh, use of force review board, isn't it uh, the mayor's um, authority to appoint civilians to boards and commissions? Mayor. Mayor would like to answer that one, perhaps. I would expect it to be. We haven't figured out the um, process for this yet. I know in Champaign, they actually rotate people through. They have a person serving on their civilian, um, uh, as a civilian on the use of force review board, and they rotate people through that position. So we'll, we, we'll need to work out that process. But I would expect it would to be coming from the mayor's office. Would it start at the chief of police's uh, position since uh, this is the use of force board is within the the, um, the police department or is this something from, like you just said, from from uh, your office? I, I honestly don't know yet. Um, I'll, be, I'll be open to suggestions. Just, and I would I would add as long as I'm, I'm talking, um, just to put into context of the 25,000 calls for service on average that the Urbana Police Department responds to or is dispatched to each year, um, roughly anywhere between 100 to 150 um, involve use of force. So about 95.5% of the calls for service to which police are dispatched do not involve use of force. So, um, so that's just the context for, for this. Okay, interesting, interesting data. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, is there is there a is it too soon to um, uh, try to figure out what kind of a person might be appointed to the uh, position? Sounds like it rather much is. I I think it is, and we can bring it back for discussion. Um, I, 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 our our priority right now is to get the use of force policy rewritten and in place. And then um, we can focus on 
the next step, which is is getting a getting the process for that person on the committee. Do we want to? Uh, I think our uh, I think the ordinance the uh, the motion was to forward it forward, but uh, or was it to keep it in committee for discussion? What's the my, my my original motion was to send it for approval, and, and I just want to say that this is kind of a supporting document uh, for the use of force policy. Um, so all of the different elements here are in support of the the prior. You know, it is very important that we get the use of force policy right. So these are all just items that help support that. Okay, we don't. Have to and I appreciate I appreciate Councilmember Wu and um, bringing this forward. This will. And Sharice, you have your hand up as well. Um, I I think I just want to uh, concur with with um, Mary Alice regarding regarding this resolution. Um, uh, the few times that we discussed it, is it we we it we are um, wanted to make sure that there was priority regarding de-escalation and ten shared principles would also be included within the use of force prop. Uh, policy. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we, we we really didn't get to discuss how a civilian would be would be chosen, but that is partially because the use of force policy is being reviewed right now and being rewritten right now, and this is something that would could be included within the the policy we we would hope itself and. That's where that is where I think the um, that uh, those particular steps would be um, put. It doesn't, you know, this doesn't make policy. It su it suggests though that you know this is what should be within within that use of force policy. I think. Am I right, Mary Alice? Is that kind yes. of how we were thinking? So um, this is something that will probably. Um, be going forth um, with Chief Serafin, and um, and how, and what he adds also to this um, this review and rewriting of the use of force policy. And I, I imagine that would be something that would be a process that would that would um, be discussed with like right now while we're doing that. Sure. Okay. And Bill, did you want to comment? And then, then um, Bill Brown. First, Bill Colbert, and then Bill Brown. Yeah, just just real quick. Um, uh, in response to Mary Alice, I mean, and, and to Sharice, as a supporting document, um, you know, I support that as well. Um, so I, I see no reason, you know, as as uh, maybe suggested to hold this in committee. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I'm going to be in support of this to to move it on to the full council. Great, and Bill Brown. Um, yeah, I think it's it's pretty much a, a summary of at least a few items that we've agreed on over the past year or so, and that the chief has agreed um, agreed to. So I think it it summarizes well um, sort of our our framework or guiding guiding principles that we want to um, see in the use of force policy and in the um, re reorganization of how force uh, uses are reviewed. Um, doesn't. Uh, really get into the CPRB yet, but um, hopefully when we start discussing that, we may have another resolution with a few points on that that we want to focus on. But I don't think it's it's not meant to be a final document or, or a policy or have a lot of details. I think it's meant more as uh, this is what we expect to see, and uh, and I think it's 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 good. I think uh, thanks for putting it together, and I think it's it's really useful to have that. Um, to show that we have a have a common, you know, uh, common way to move forward on these. Yes, I think I think I agree too. Certainly, de-escalation is a very important topic of redirection for activity in the police department uh, as a concern for the as stated by the public. So, um, without further comments or questions, uh, I'll ask the uh, clerk to please call the roll. Ms. Wu. Yes. Mr. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Colebrook? Yes. Okay, I believe that passes.
unanimously. Can you clarify, was that on the consent agenda as well? No, this one was not. No, no. okay. All right, uh, the last item on, the last item here is uh, an ordinance. This is uh, agenda number nine. Uh, an ordinance number 2021-01003, an ordinance amending the city code chapter 12, dealing with exceptions to the human rights ordinance. And I think Carol Minton, are you gonna be leading forth on this one presentation? I am, and uh, Jason, I'm hoping he'll bring up a few slides for me here okay. shortly. And um, Pete Resnick is here um, uh, from the uh, HRC to answer questions, um, if you should have any as we go along. So um, thank you for letting me bring this back. I'm gonna take a, uh, what I hope is a, a, a better run at, at this topic uh, than I did last time. There were, um, I think uh, if you would go to the next slide, Jason, thanks. So I, what I didn't do a good job uh, with last time was clarifying that, that I think there are two distinctly different issues. They're not, I mean, completely unrelated, but there are two distinct issues and they got conflated the last time. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and do a better job of, of keeping them separate. So um, the first issue is clarifying the existing human rights ordinance. So we have, um, we have, we have a, a case from November 10th, and then we have subsequent cases that have come in. And so we, we need to clarify what is the ordinance as, as written, what does it mean? And in order to clarify it, it means we have to change it somewhat. And, and so I'll talk about that. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the second issue is, do you want to change the human rights ordinance to the to the, you know uh, setting aside the clarification issue? Are there things that you want to do that are that are broader than that? So those are the two issues um, as I see them. So the relevant sections of the human rights ordinance, which they were called out in the in the memo, it's in the definition section. It, it's employer refers to any person. And, and then person is defined as including government agencies. So employer, government agency, they seem to be included. And then other under exceptions in 12105D, it says the provisions of this article should not apply to other units of government, which has led to some confusion over time. And clearly, um, while people don't necessarily um, agree that on how to resolve the ambiguity, there has been near unanimity over the years that there is ambiguity that we had always intended to resolve and it just it, it just never got resolved because of you know staff time limitations. But here we are and we're spending the staff time now to, to take care of it. So could I ask Carol? Um were the definitions that we're looking at, um, are they from the state or a federal or are, are they penned by uh, us as an agent of a municipality? They're from Urbana City Code. Okay. Okay, so um, to, uh, to try and resolve the ambiguity. Okay, as I, as I said, there are cases that are pending under the current ordinance. So we, we really need some action to resolve this ambiguity. Um, the case from November 10th, which I tried to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to repeat everything that's in the memo, but in, in trying to lay out what, what happened after that decision by the informal hearing body that the, um, that the human rights or human relations commission has jurisdiction that immediately started to lead to a series of conflicts. And that has basically stalled things from being resolved. And so I tried to lay out you know, why conciliation wasn't possible because of the, you know, because of the role that members of the HRC were trying to play, but they were, you know, they would ultimately be the adjudicatory body. So that, you know, there were conflicts created there and that would have, you know, there would have been this ex parte um, relationship that was, that was uh, developed. And so, um, so that's, I, I hope that you can see using the example of the November 10th um, case that these ambiguities exist and, the, and these conflicts exist. And so when I say the ambiguity should be resolved in the most straightforward way possible, if, if you have to contort a, a, a bunch of things in, in either changing the ordinance or interpreting the ordinance where there, where there is a straightforward answer, 
Um, I don't think that that is the appropriate way to, to um, view the intent of the existing ordinance because you, that it should be the most straightforward thing that is the um, suggested interpretation, I guess. Um, that's the way I would uh, recommend it to you. So, um, so what, what, what you have from me as a draft ordinance is, um, and Jason, you can go to the next slide, is to, is to do a couple of things. One would be to add a new section 12.1, which is the city's commitment to comply with division two of uh, the human rights ordinance and division two are the, the provisions uh, about discrimination. So it's, it's not the parts that have to do with um, uh, the jurisdiction of the HRC to enforce it and, and, and all that process, but it does affirm our co commitment. So we're not seeking to be exempt from the, the, um, the, we're not seeking to be exempt from the discriminatory practices aspect of it. It's just, there needs to be a different approach to enforcement in my, in my mind, in my mind. Um, the draft ordinance would add a new section 12-22G and 12-22G um, would create a role for the um, HRC to facilitate compliance by the city um, that would not create these jurisdictional conflicts that we have currently. Um, we would amend the definition of person to remove government agencies. And there's a couple of other little tweaks in there. Um, and then, and this is a little bit different um, from what was in the, um, the version that was in your packet I had sent around uh, a note to all of you that I was going to be introducing this. So in the, in the packet version, it said that we would amend um, section 12105D and uh, thanks to Bill Brown, he, um, he, had, he had actually told me this twice and it took a couple, a couple times from my little brain to process it, um, that really what we wanted to be exempt from was not a wholesale exemption, which is what the, what the change to 12105D did, but rather that um, the city would only be exempt from the provisions of divisions three and four. So that is a companion piece to our commitment to comply with the non-discriminatory practices of division two. So that's what the draft ordinance would do, which I think is the most straightforward way to resolve this, this conflict. And then, um, it, uh, then, then we move to the possible ordinance changes, which is what the HRC explored in their resolution. And you now, in, in the memo, you have a link to their meeting and you have, um, as an attachment to the memo, you have the, the text of their resolution. Um, they offered two paths and one would be make the city subject to the human um, rights ordinance and the jurisdiction of the HRC. And then, um, the other would be to have the city not subject to um, the human rights ordinance, but to, to communicate our intent to comply with the provisions of division two. So, um, you know, the, um, you can go to the next slide, uh, Jason. So the thing, this, there's, a, there's a really thorny issue that, that, that we still have to wrestle with in order to, if, even if we want to, um, pursue the path that the um, HRC had proposed about this, um, this, uh, these, the jurisdictional issue and the conflicts it creates. So um, you heard reference tonight to, um, to uh, provisions of our, of our code, um, I believe it was chapter two, article nine, about conflicts of interest. And those are personal conflicts of interest. So like when it when an individual has a conflict of interest for whatever reason they're related to somebody or they have a business interest with somebody or whatever it is, um, you can you basically can take that person out of the equation and plug someone else in. The problem with the with the conflicts that are created through this are that they're conflicts of affiliation. So we are we are all you know all these players, um, city staff, um, city attorney. Um, you know, the members of the, of the um, uh, HRC, members of other, um, members of other boards and commissions, we are all agents of the city in one way or another. And, um, you know, we, we talk about how you could 
possibly begin to resolve that. And so then, you know, the other point I want to make is the conflicts of affiliation can be attenuated, but they can't be eliminated. So we could hire outside counsel to to, to um, prosecute a case, for instance, but it's still, you know, the city is still hiring that person. The city is still overseeing that person. The city still, you know, elects who, which um, attorney they would hire. The same thing would be true um, uh, for an investigator. We're still, you know, because we have this contractual relationship, we're not completely removed from the process. So, um, you know, and, and, I, and I, I mentioned that, you know, the, the way to, to really not, if attenuated to the maximum extent possible would be to create a, a completely independent um, HRC. And then, you know, I had been asked um, by um, at least one council member to give some sense of like, oh, okay, how much uh, would all this cost? And so, you know, I, there's not a lot of benchmarks that, that, that I could pr provide, but um, I, but Mary Alice had specifically mentioned the electoral board and um, and so the 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 seventeen thousand seven hundred forty five dollars is the cost of the the work that Deanna Mool did um, in conducting um, those hearings, preparing and conducting those hearings. Um, I I include there the budget for the HREO hearings, which is um, you know that that budget is intended to cover CPRB hearings and um, HRC hearings combined, that's for hearing officers only in each case. And then Pete had mentioned a, um, a case where it was an HRC case. Um, it was in the paper um, back in the early 2000s, I think. Um, and, and so some of you might remember it. It's, um, the, the caption of the case was Sprout versus Carl Foundation Hospital. That was a that was a case where the city attorney elected to hire outside counsel to prosecute the case rather than do it in house, and that cost the city about thirty five thousand dollars to prosecute that particular case. So um, you know, just to give you a sense of that, and that's for you know that's for in, in that in the Sprout case that was for you know um, an outside uh, lawyer to prosecute the. Um, uh, a, a case before the HRC that was not an independent investigator. Uh, we didn't have a cost associated with that. And these other one, these other ones, as I said, are for hearing officers only. So um, I, I, I don't think that the, the financial question is inconsequential, um, which is why I'm glad someone asked the question about it. Um, I, think, I think it is relevant to your consideration. And I would say, um, before I get to my last slide, that um, Bill Brown had asked me um, to think about, um, well, what, what, what would we do? What could we do if, there was, um, if somebody had alleged that there was um, discrimination by the city? And so I wanted, I, 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 I talked about it in my response to him in, in sort of two categories. And, and one category is if we have an individual employee of the city discriminating against an, you know, a member of the public or, or, or something, it's sort of the individual action of discrim, an individual act of discrimination. And um, those kinds of, of um, complaints could be pursued um, I think they would be pursued as personnel matters because we have a you know productive work environment uh, policy, and so that that we would pursue you know using city resources with with a member of our staff, and we would you know take whatever appropriate action there is. Then there's another category of um, of discrimination that I think of in a more policy realm. And I think that those are exactly the kinds of things that the, that the process that um, that's in the draft ordinance that as recommended by the HRC, those are appropriate to be discussed in, a, in, a, in front of a public body like the HRC, even the city council if people cared to, because those are broader, broader um, questions and they probably um, are, deserve you know, a public airing and, and public discussion rather than being handled, you know, in, in kind of a, the context of a hearing. 
So, um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you see the distinction between these two issues. And my recommendation is so that we can, so that we can handle these, um, these cases that we have before us is that you would, um, in terms of resolving this, this existing conflict, send the revised draft ordinance to council with a recommendation for approval. And then should you desire to make these more substantive um, uh, modifications to the uh, human rights ordinance and give broader powers to the um, to the HRC and uh, you know seek to attenuate this conflict um, that you take it up when you um, when we take up the budget because the um, you know the financial implications are um, of a of a magnitude that I think it's appropriate in that context. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so so do we need to have a, a motion first and then, oh, not questions, we can add quick to ask questions. And the Mary, I see your hand is up. I just wanted, I don't have a question. I just wanted to tag on to what Carol said and make it perfectly clear. The city follows the same process with regard to employment as all employers are expected to follow in Urbana. That is following the, the um, requirements of the human rights ordinance. We have never exempted ourselves in practice. It's just this inherent ambiguity that was in this ordinance from the beginning. That, that's the issue here. But as far as actual practice, we have never exempted ourselves from that, even though that's the narrative that, that some folks are, are, are using out there. It's just that it's the ambiguity written into this ordinance itself. And, and if someone could describe the cases that are before the HRC, I think it's important for people to know what actually are the cases. It's not an actual person being discriminated against? Um, I can, I can, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but I, I can tell you that there have been multiple cases that are, that are like the November 10th case. And uh, Pete, you can correct me if I get anything wrong on this, but it's, it's basically that, um, that the city discriminated against, uh, you know, un uh, unnamed people, pr pr uh, prospective job applicants by the manner in which we, um, th the manner in which we communicate that certain positions are subject to um, criminal background checks. And, and uh, the, the objection was that none should be? Um, well, I, I, I think there's still a debate going on about exactly uh, um, what the resolution of it is. Um, would you say that's true, Pete? <laughs> well, um, the ordinance has a section about you can't advertise anything in a job advertisement that might imply that you would discriminate. And um, the job advertisements the city put out um, had information saying there will be a criminal background check, something to that effect. And so the complaints, at least what's been made public, is that those job advertisements violate that section of the ordinance where it says you can't say something in the job advertisement that implies that you will discriminate, in this case, against someone who has a prior arrest or conviction record. And we did um, modify uh, what we would advertise. And I, I think there's an ongoing discussion about, um, about how, we, how we represent that. I, 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 I think what I wanna say that um, I don't think that there is an issue about whether we can use criminal background checks um, to um, screen applicants at a certain point in the process. It's about whether we are in, in, in communicating how we do that, whether we're sort of categorically um, communicating that we're, that we're discriminating or that we are um, discouraging certain people from applying. So it, it's a conversation I'm happy to have in front of the council even, but it's, it's separate and apart from the jurisdictional issue. But that's the issue that's that triggered. Well, the yeah, there, there's um, there's about uh, there's a, a number of cases that have come in since the November 10th case um, with that 
um, fact pattern for lack of a better word. And then there's at least one other um, that's different, but it's also against the city. I can't, I can't remember what that one is. So there are about, um, I think there's about eight cases pending at this, at the moment. And then, so is the, is a, so is, is a solution that all applications that are published need to be open, but then once you start interviewing people and start limiting the field, then you can begin doing the other kinds of things. Well, I don't want to, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm happy to have a, a conversation about that, but that, that's separate from the jurisdictional issue. So, okay. All right. So then I'll take questions or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Mary Alice and then Bill Brown. So I think, um, I, I think that Diane talked a bit about one of the big concerns with this is that is the city upholding the same, um, the same rules for um, how we conduct business versus how we are expecting other businesses to conduct business. I mean, and the I answer is yes. And <laughs> I was going to say that I don't think anybody on council would say no. Um, so I, I think that there's consensus that everybody agrees that the city should adhere to its own rules in terms of employment process. I don't think there's any. The, the complication then comes into redress, right? How, uh, how could an individual um, who feels that they've been discriminated by the city, not by an employee, but by the city as a whole, um, what redress do they have? So I, I actually talked to Esther Pack because I know that she was highly involved with the drafting of the original ordinance and I wanted to get her take on this. Um, and she had an interesting suggestion. And so Pete, I, I wanted to just kind of ask you if you guys had considered this at all. And her suggestion was to um, have a, an agreement with the city of Champaign, intergovernmental agreement in which they would be the ones who would take on um, kind of the role of being uh, overseeing the case, the investigatory stuff. Um, it would address what Carol is you know, concerned about, which is that the city still has a process in this, that all the employees and so forth, that's, even if we hired an outside council, that outside council would still be paid for by the city of Urbana and, and we would have a contract versus the city of Champaign could hire that person and just bill us for the amount. So I'm wondering if that had ever come into the conversation, Pete, about maybe one way to think about how to handle this conflict of interest. We had not talked about that in the HRC at all. Uh, that uh, idea didn't come up. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the ordinances are different. So if we were to have right. that kind of intergovernmental agreement, we'd have to agree to each other's, review each other's ordinances yeah. and make sure that we, we were applying the right uh, uh, standards and such. But uh, we, we didn't think about it. Okay. All right. I mean, so so then to speak a little bit of what Carol was talking about in terms of like, if if we stand up some other procedure, I mean, that there are financial consequences to that, and perhaps the best time to have that is when we go over the budget. Um, I I would hesitate to. Say, I don't know if the city of Urbana is willing to commit approximately a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to stand up a full staff and so forth for the city of our size. But I thought that this was an interesting compromise, so to speak, um, versus, uh, so, so the amount of money, would it be more than, you know, 5,000, 20,000, I think is, is one of the uh, budgetary items here? Probably it would be, but would it be less than 100,000? Yeah, it would be less than $100,000. Um, I know I'm kind of springing this on staff right now. I just had this conversation with Esther. And any, anyway, I just wanted to present that as one possible uh, avenue to explore. Um, that said, I will say I, I recognize that we have we have two issues here. We have what is pending, what are the current cases that are kind of on the docket versus what do we need to be doing in the future. Um, so you know that that is certainly part of the conversation too. But I wanted to share that information with you based on that conversation that I had. Very interesting. Anyone else would like to comment? Uh, Eric Sack. So uh, sort of two things. One, did I understand correctly, Carol, that the HRC was saying that our, they thought the options were either city is under HRO and therefore under HRC or not under either, but really what we're talking about is city is under HRO, but possibly not under HRC for its own 
uh, self adjudication. Is that that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and that's and I mean, in the broadest sense, that's those are the, the, the that's what the HRC said. Also, they have a slightly different rendition of it than mm -hmm. is in the draft ordinance. Right. But, yeah, but it's either you're fully under and somehow resolve the conflicts that exist, or um, we are not subject to the jurisdiction of the HRC process. But but um, in both cases, we agree that the city should be subject to Division Two. Right. So yeah, I would be pretty comfortable with the city is still subject to the HRO, so we're subject to our own rules, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe not. Uh, self uh, self adjudicating. I think mm -hmm. the problem with self adjudicating is that um, it can be very expensive, and I think we would leave ourselves open to um, someone trying to use that as a cudgel to uh, uh, impoverish the city. So one could imagine someone creating a lot of cases which then have to be adjudicated, and if you have to. Uh, pay for a lawyer separately each time, it could cost a lot of money. Um, whereas if it goes to the courts, well then uh, that's a disincentive to uh, 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 put in spurious cases because then the city isn't paying for the other person's court case. That's my thoughts. It could happen. It could happen. We could imagine it. It could we be could weaponized. Imagine it. Yes. Bill Brown. Um, so under, with the example that you gave us on the, uh, um, the reference to background checks. So if that were, if we, uh, pass the draft ordinance as, as presented pretty much, there might be some changes still as far as which parts might still apply. But, um, the main thing would be this section, this new section 1222 G that, so the, um, HRC would still review um, the practice and, and uh, review it with mayor, city council, city departments, agencies, and officials in order to correct any discrimination that may exist and notify the public of the outcome. So it's not clear to me that that's um, as open as kind of what it, the way you were talking about it, it sounded like more like public meetings. Um, but it seems like in order to review it with the city council, it has to be brought to the city council in a public meeting. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, notify the public of the outcome, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how, what the outcome would be. It's, um, would the outcome be a, a new resolution by city council maybe, or some decision by city council? Well, I mean, it, it could be that, I mean, it, it, for my, you know, my thought is there's the HRC and this uh, this 1222G process that, you know, could could be, you know, they could say, look, we've gotten this complaint about the city and, you know, we, we're, we're going to talk about it in an open session or we're going to delegate or designate someone to, to talk to the city about this and see if we can facilitate a result or whatever. But, you know, there's nothing stopping somebody from from saying, you know what? I'm, I'm not only going to go to HRC, I'm going to bring it to city council. I mean, people come all the time and raise issues yeah. and, and, and see if, if, if they can get traction. I mean, if people are really concerned, they have outlets. Okay. Yeah. So I would expect for that particular application or ad that there would be some decision. I, I, I agree that um, as I mean, just on, on its surface, um, it might prevent somebody from applying for the job. So it seems like there might be some change needed in, in the ad that we place or in the way that we uh, present on our applications. So um, if, this, if this was adopted, then there would be some discussion of that. And uh, if it's resolved, with staff and the HRC, then city council would have a report on it and we could discuss it at some point. Does that sound right? We could do that or, I mean, oh, go ahead, Pete, go ahead. I, I just wanna put a little interrupt in here and I was trying to be as careful as I could to be talking about the previous, the, the ordinance itself in the previous hearing. 
we have some confidentiality issues even with pending cases that we're really not supposed to talk about the contents of pending cases um, uh, that, that have not been part of public hearing. That said, um, that should both inform asking perhaps the complainant whether they want anything public said while, they're, while their case is going on and whether negotiations are taking place. Um, the confidentiality rules in the current ordinance are pretty darn tight. Mm -hmm. So you may want to review how you want that to happen should you make a change that says we're going to have some sort of, you know, um, conciliation or discussion as per 1222G. Um, and, and we should probably avoid talking about any pending cases during the council meeting. Okay. But, um, so, so are you, are you saying I shouldn't be talking about what I'm talking about? Or are you just saying that in this policy, we need to be careful about I, talking about I think you shouldn't talk about specifics of pending cases. If you want to talk about pending cases as a general category, I think that's perfectly reasonable, but the, the, the right. topics of specific pending cases is not a public conversation according to the current ordinance. Yeah, well, I don't know who, the, I don't know much about the case, so. Uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> general, you know, um, I'm familiar with um, how the ban the box, you know, we talk, talk about ban the box, and that's been an issue for a long time about um, not putting people off to apply for jobs just because they have a felony conviction. Um, and it can't be broadly, you can't broadly discriminate against somebody because of their conviction history. Um, but I know that, you know, there's jobs that you need, you can't have certain convictions for certain jobs. Um, so, yeah, so that's getting into the details a little too much, but I guess if that's a policy or a practice, a, a way of implementing our hiring practices, um, that seems like it could be discussed separately without talking about details of a case, but maybe, maybe the case has to be resolved in some fashion first, is that before we could, I, I don't know, it, it sounds a little complicated. <laughs> Cherise, you, you have I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to wrap my head around all, all of this language, all this legalese. Because um, what I'm thinking from what Carol has said is that you know, all this came about behind background checks or advertised background checks, correct? Yes, how we how we advertise um, the our use of background checks. That that was the topic of the November tenth um, uh, hearing. Okay, and and Pete, please, you know, do like this or something if I if I if I'm going too far. Okay. Um. I don't think anybody, I don't think any city government would hire somebody like Abramoff to be their financial director. Okay. We would not, if we do not know this person, let's say, you know, an, an Abramoff type of person puts in an application and we see all these great things on paper. And of course, he's wonderful in the interview. And then we do a background check and find out, oh, you know, this, this, and this happened with money related issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's just um, common yeah. sense that you're okay. I'm so stop. <laughs> I'll. The, the only thing I'll say about this is um, I think it's worth a read. And as Carol said, we, we could have a whole discussion about the contents of this part of the ordinance. It's, it's very interesting and, and a good discussion. There was a document written some years ago when Todd Rent was um, HRO. And I think we can get a copy of it for you. But it basically describes the process you should go through if you're gonna try and use a background check to stay clear of violation of the ordinance, because it's more complicated than what you just described. 
because okay. you have to make a showing that whatever you're disqualifying this person for, whatever trade it is, that it is actually necessary to their job function. Um, okay. and, and, and the hoops that you have to go through to make sure that you do that in a way that's defensible and it's no guarantee that you're still not violating the ordinance it is actually pretty interesting and complicated. And, and I suggest taking a look at that because there is something to be said for maybe if, Jack Abramoff goes through the whole interview process and comes through with flying colors. And the only thing about him that's a problem is his criminal background that you might still have to hire him. So but I'm <laughs> okay, but I'm not just thinking about it's 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 a, a criminal background relating to the specific, you know, things that he would have to he would have to do. I, I hear what you're saying and it's surprisingly complicated. Okay. But what isn't complicated is this jurisdictional question. <laughs> yeah, so but and I'm just saying with the jurisdictional the jurisdictional issue brought up before before us regarding this it also it, it um it also I I don't really understand um, um, how we would go about even trying to um, to uh, ameliorate the 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 because they're just so close together in some some level. How you know how do you match that up? I don't. I'm I'm just still trying to like I said wrap my head around it. So I saw somebody else's hand, um, Bill Colebrook. Yeah, actually, I think this last 10 minutes has been incredibly informative. So Sharice, your, your question was, was on point. And Pete, your explanation was, was, was on point as well. And I think Carol, your explanation to the resolution to the problem is on point as well. So um, you know, to Eric's point earlier, so that, that's a possibility, yes. Sharice's example, is a possibility. Pete, you give the clear vision uh, or the reality of what the consequences of the, of the ordinance could be to the city. And Carol, you just gave a clear path of how that could be resolved. Um, and I appreciate that conversation. I, I do wanna add in also, um, and it's, it really hasn't been talked about, but uh, you know, Bill Brown mentioned it as well, you know, we're not supposed to discriminate based on criminal background record, but but you know there is some positions that um, that as a city we don't want you know we can we can exclude certain people firefighter police officer you know are the obvious ones right um, you know the Department of Human Rights only the Department of Human Rights you know if if somebody that it's been talked about that there's no path there's no regress for people. Um, I believe that that people do have a path. If if, this, if somebody believes that the city of Urbana, as, as an entity, um, discriminated against them based solely on their criminal record, then if you just look at the Illinois Department of Human Rights uh, website, it clearly shows that that's a path. Uh, if you look at the federal EEOC, uh, criminal background record is not one of the uh, protected classes, but in the state of Illinois, it is. So there is a path, but we just don't talk about that, you know, that often. So I just appreciate the conversation because it has informed me of what path I want to go down. <laughs> Mary Alice Wu. Bill, you had you had just mentioned a couple of things. And so one of the things that I did was I took our classes and I took what I found in the state of Illinois, um, human, uh, see here, human rights ordinance to, to figure out which, which ones don't overlap. And, and the ones that I came up with, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm just looking at the Illinois Human Rights Ordinance, and it sounds like there's other ordinances, sorry, there's other statutes out there uh, that might apply here. But the ones that um, we have, that the Illinois does not have, are physical, personal appearance, uh, family responsibilities, and uh, political affiliation. Those are the three that I was able to find. Are you aware of any Illinois state statutes that um, 
say that we can't discriminate based on those three items, Bill? I'm not aware, no, but that was a great, that's a great uh, comparison. So thank you. Yeah. I, and, and by the way, uh, I, as I went through, there's a whole list of things that we can't discriminate based on the state of Illinois that's not in ours. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, we, we can't discriminate based on, on pregnancy, for example, in the state of Illinois. We can't discriminate based on unfavorable military discharge. Um, we can't discriminate based on citizenship status. So there are other, other items in the state of Illinois that aren't in our human rights ordinance. Hmm. Eric Sachs. So I believe, so the issue of, of uh, uh, the background checks, there's the issue of performing them and how you uh, use them, and then there's the issue of the advertisement. Those are separate issues. But I believe that the state of Illinois requires for state em employment background checks. And therefore, we would probably be, it, one possibility is to just completely adopt what the state does in terms of language and, and process, right? That would be a simple option. In terms of uh, language and advertisements, I believe what I've seen is usually some language that says that uh, background checks are performed, but uh, that may that doesn't necessarily exclude one from the possibility of employment. There's some boilerplate language I'm sure one could grab from the state uh, that would uh, be proper to use. Well, you know, I mean, it, just in general, it's important to get this right. And, and we're very interested in getting it right because, you know, uh, what Pete was saying was there, you know, there was this, I, I don't know if you called it a manual or something that, that Todd had put together, but is it, this is not just about Urbana. This is about what we tell employers, okay? So um, th this, is, this is not just about, a, a, you know, a, a unique problem that we have. This is about how we educate um, our uh, local employers about how to how to comply with our ordinance. So it's it's very important to get it right. And it, if I can follow up to what Carol's saying, first of all, I should note that the um, the state um, statute does not prevent as much um, criminal background check as the our local ordinance does. There are a bunch of things you can do at the state level that you simply cannot do under the local ordinance. Um, and a lot of those categories, uh, uh, matriculation status is one of the others that I yeah. kind of like, it's a fun one. Um, but our categories are also not complete. There's a whole um, line about and other things that are not uniquely related to um, uh, uh, qualifications. Um, family responsibility covers pregnancy and, and, and we, we've got a broader set than the state does overall. Um, so the state is not a complete solution to this problem by any means by saying to people, just go to IDHR um, because there's a bunch of things that you simply can't do that with. Um, and, and some of the employment stuff is clearly on that list. So are there other uh, states who uh, have great models that we could look at? I mean, have, have we researched further afield? Maybe it's not necessary. Yeah. I, I, can, I can say that we predated a lot of states um, in ours and ours is uh, pretty broad as far as um, ordinances go um, and just to go back to what Carol said initially, we are still, no matter what we look at, we are still stuck with the current language in the ordinance being ambiguous whether the ordinance applies to the city. Um, there's, there's no two ways about that. And, and it's been true as long as I've been on the commission and the topic has come up multiple times since I've been on the commission. Um, it's only really come to a head and gone to this appeals hearing recently, uh, as recently as November. Um, so uh, either way, that issue should probably be addressed one way or the other. Getting back to 
what you want the ordinance to say more broadly, I, I have reservations. I know the rest of the HRC has reservations about opening up too much of the ordinance because we did have a really, we do have a very solid progressive ordinance here. Um, and we would rather leave that as intact as we can. Um, but clearing up the ambiguity about the city is the most important point here. Okay. So is there a, a, a feeling that we need to work on this more in committee before this progresses or are people ready to formulate um, a solution? <laughs> it seems like we're not quite to a solution yet, but Bill Brown? I think, uh... I think the draft is pretty close. There might be a few, um, a few things that staff will want to change um, as far as particulars of which parts of division three or four might not apply to us. But, but we, we basically just want to make sure that people understand that the non-discrimination applies. We don't, we don't right. get out of complying with our human rights ordinance. The only thing that we want to exempt the city from is the process that would create the conflict when you have the hearing at the HRC. And we're trying to substitute a different process for that that would be a little bit more uh, negotiating and, and bringing it to the public bodies that can change, make the changes in city policy if city policy needs to be changed um, in order to prevent any kind of discrimination. Um, so I. I think I'm okay with going ahead and sending this forward. Um, could send it forward. Has there been a motion yet? No, there has not. Well, I'd, I'd make a motion to send um, the ordinance. This is an ordinance. Ordinance number 2021-01-003. Thanks to city council, forward to the city council with no recommendation um, until we have a, another draft to look at. Pending a draft. I'll yes. second it. Okay, Charisse makes a second. Other uh, discussion? Does that feel comfortable to everybody? Bill Brown or uh, Bill Colbrook. I'll go ahead and uh, support that, but I would have probably made a motion just to uh, send it to the council for consideration, but. Um, you know, I, I'll support Bill Brown's um, motion to sit it, send it to city council, you know, without a recommendation, but it, you know, I think we're very, very close. Um, I, I think the, um, the discussion that's happened tonight has, um, and I, I know I'm repeating myself, but um, I, I think it's clarified the predicament that we're in, in the, you know, in the city and, and what, the, um, what the, the most clear path is for us as a city, keeping in mind all the other discussion that we've had, that we still, you know, would uh, hold ourselves accountable to, you know, the provisions of the ordinance as well, uh, in in the other um, uh, respects. Okay, it sounds fine. Um, so perhaps we're ready for a, a roll call vote. Would the clerk please conduct a roll call vote? Miss Wu. Yes. Mr. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Colebrook? Yes. May I just say one thing, Dennis? Go ahead, yes. Um, thank you, that, that, that's a good outcome. Pete had already suggested some, a, little, a few more tweaks, so that's, that's, that's very good. I just need to um, let you know that it's going to be late because this is Wednesday and the packets go out tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, it, it'll come over the weekend um, if that's acceptable. Is that gonna work for the public? What's the what's the posting requirement, Phyllis? Yeah. You may have to- 48 hours prior 48 to- 48 hours, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll work with 48 hours. Okay. And then Mayor Marlin. Just want to say if the language that um, is presented to the council and is approved next week and 
uh, and voted on, you will have resolved an ambiguity that has existed since the day this ordinance was originally passed. And that is a major, major accomplishment. So I look forward to that day. <laughs> and thank you. And I, I uh, think that um, I forgot to mention that Jared Miller had already had also made some questions, which um, I think he shared with all of us. So I'll enter those into the record rather than go over them again right now. I think we've pretty much solved a lot of the questions that might've been raised. But we appreciate his input, even though he's not here too. All right, so let's see. So let's see now, how do we handle that? We, we, did we call our roll yet? Have we already resolved that? Did I just talk through my, we did, all right. So then the last item on the agenda is uh, announcements from members of the, the, the Committee of the Whole uh, or any input. I just wanna mention something that uh, the Sister City uh, Committee is working on. It has been working on for a couple months now. Um, we're trying to encourage two different projects. One of them is a uh, language, French, French English language exchange project between our sister city in Tionville and Urbana. Um, this was presented to us by the counselor of the Twinning Cities program in Tionville. He wondered if there was a way that uh, students in France could practice their English and would there be advanced students in schools in Urbana who would like to practice French through an exchange. So um, I've contacted uh, various uh, educators who are language instructors in the city. I've sent a letter to the, the, the Board of Education for Unit 116 and also I contacted the administrator at uh, Uni High School to find out if there was any interest in this. And to date, we seem to have one instructor at Uni High School who's very, very interested. And uh, so they are, that individual is pursuing um, uh, further discussion with a counselor in Chilmville to uh, connect a school there to, a, to um, the classes that she's interested in pursuing here locally. So that's one project that we're working on. The second one is that since uh, last June, we've actually been trying to create a, uh, um, a collaborative music program with the city of Chonville, uh, which involves uh, sharing a song and uh, singing um, different parts of the songs by different uh, community members, soloists and artists in our community and our community in Chonville. Um, we've virtually recorded all the lines for the song and it's being uh, processed and, and, and compiled now by a technician. And this, and this uh, uh, program um, is one that uh, we're doing in conjunction with um, James Barham, who, uh, who helped to create the beautiful uh, uh, music video, See You uh, Sings, Let It Be, Volume One. So what we're doing is we're trying to I suggested to him that it might be exciting to try to do this with our French sister city. Um, he was very excited to agree. And the sister city in, um, in Chilonville was also very interested in it. So we're in the process now of kind of coordinating those efforts. So hopefully we'll see pretty soon uh, our actual announcement that we have something to show and share with the community. So Bill. I just want to take this opportunity to um, to thank uh, the city staff, uh, uh, specifically uh, Public Works, all the um, all the city staff that um, went out into the snow. Um, I don't think it was officially called a blizzard, but uh, sure did look like a blizzard. Um, I know they did a, just a wonderful job uh, keeping the um, uh, streets cleared as they could, uh, given the harsh conditions. Then on top of that, the uh, firefighters and police officers and all of the other um, city employees that were out there helping um, keep our residents stay, uh, safe in very dangerous conditions. So thank you. I agree with that. Other comments? Bill Brown. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I also um, add to uh, thanks to the people who've been shoveling their sidewalks. I uh, walk to work every morning and this morning I walking clear down to uh, Michigan Avenue and then like from uh, I think from Carl, Carl to Lincoln on Michigan Avenue, every single lot had their had the sidewalks shoveled and it wasn't all one snowblower either. You could tell there were different styles. Every, a lot of people have been out shoveling. So um, just really appreciate that. Yes, we had a pretty heavy snow, one of the heaviest we've had in quite a while. And um, people have been very considerate, I thought too. So, so anyways, um, others, any other comments? Mary Alice Wu. Um, I'm not sure if, if other know if other people know this, but apparently our community is getting a new area code, and that new area code is going to mandate that we dial 217 in front of all of our phone numbers as soon as that goes live. So I thought the public should be aware that that's that's coming on board. I think in the next 10 days. I think it's the 27th of February. Yeah, that's 10 days. Yeah. yeah. A new. Uh, growth and the, and the complexities of growth. All right. Well, then seeing others, uh, I'll bid us adieu. Thank you for coming and uh, we'll talk again. Good night, everybody. Good night.